So today is today. I'll take a little detour first. Um, there was a Japanese priest in Japantown in San Francisco in the early 1960s who, of a sect of Japanese Zen that was different than Japanese Buddhism, different than Zen. But he went to visit uh, the Zen master nearby. Uh, he was a, uh, This priest was young and he went to visit Suzuki Roshi, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center. And uh, since he was a Buddhist priest, he had studied Buddhism and stuff. And so at some point, Suzuki Roshi asked him if he'd give a talk at his Zen temple in English. And the other priest said, no, no, I, my English is not good enough. The next time the priest came to here, listen to Suzuki Roshi give a Dharma talk. Suzuki Roshi's talk went like this. Today is today. Today is not yesterday. Today is not tomorrow. Today is today. And uh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight words in English that he used. That was the entire Dharma talk. And the priest who was there, he told me the story, uh, said, said I, he believes Suzuki Roshi gave him an example of how to give a Dharma talk with very little English. And I say it today because of this way of letting each thing be discreet. Today is today, just today. Today is not yesterday, it's not tomorrow. This moment is, can be just this moment. It's not two minutes ago, two seconds ago, it's not two minutes in the future, two seconds ago. Um, the, um, so the, um, the discreteness, the, the uniqueness of each moment. And of course there is a past and a future, but there's a way in which the past and the future belongs or is reconstructed in our memory, in our ideas, our stories. We sew it together, we, you know, once the present moment is gone, it exists as kind of a memory and ideas and stories to a great extent. As the meditative mind becomes quieter, we're more and more living just in the present, just in the present. And as the meditative mind stops the activity of making stories, it's more and more just this experience of the moment that happens. And with deeper and deeper, at some point what we start seeing is that uh, all the experiences we have as experiences are coming and going, appearing and disappearing. Not because we're searching for that or looking for that, but because uh, it's very quiet, very uh, still. And um, so the idea of, um, so the Buddha said that um, instructing the, the monkey, the, the, his monks, um, develop concentration. For those who have concentration will see things as they are. They will see suffering, the arising of suffering, the ceasing of suffering, and the practice of the ceasing of suffering. So that looks like the wording that we're familiar with in the Four Noble Truths. Uh, the truth of suffering, the truth of the rising of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering, the truth of the practice leading to the cessation of suffering. But we have to be, uh, uh, what's interesting is that, uh, so the Buddha begins by saying, develop concentration, which means a samadhi, a meditative mind, with that concentrated, clear, quiet mind that's not sewing things together, constructing things with the thinking mind. Then we'll see things as they are. We'll see the inconstant nature of phenomena, how things come and go, arise and pass. And we'll see, um, uh, we'll see into the nature of, um, yeah, just see the impermanence, the inconstancy, the change of phenomena. And the Buddha repeated this many ways. He, sometimes it was explicit. He said, develop concentration, you'll see things as they are, then you'll see inconstancy or impermanence, the coming and going of experience. 
develop concentration. Then you'll see things as they are. You'll see things appear and disappear. But he also had this expression, you'll see suffering, the arising, the ceasing, and the, the practice leading to the ceasing. He, Buddha said this about the insight, the understanding, the deep uh, knowledge of this experience of suffering, it's arising, it's ceasing, and realizing this is the, the practice for the cessation of suffering. Hundreds of times in the suttas. It refers to seeing uh, the moment to moment in the discrete moments of this just experience, seeing how experiences come and go, arise and pass. That nothing is, uh, nothing in our experience is constant. It might be continuous in that it keeps reappearing, but it's like those ants that are discrete, each one. So the insight into whatever suffering we have, whatever distress, whatever discomfort we have, in a meditative mind, to see that in the moment to moment, the way it unfolds before we overlay our ideas on top of it, to sew it together, it's actually not so solid. It comes and goes and rises and passes. This, the Buddha described, is the insight that leads to liberation. So I call it liberating insight. He talks about this over and over and over again. Generally, people when they read the suttas will think whether when Buddha talks about suffering, the arising of suffering, the ceasing of it, and the practice leading to the ceasing of it, that the Buddha is talking about what we think of as the Four Noble Truths. And then there's all these talks about suffering are the aggregates of clingings, there's a cause for suffering, it's in craving, there's the, the cessation of suffering, and then there's the Eightfold Path, which is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. That's the common understanding. Surprisingly, given how strong emphasis there is that the Four Noble Truths in this kind of more or less explanation is the common teaching of the Buddha, the most central teaching of the Buddha, in this ancient text, the Buddha almost never taught about the Four Noble Truths that way. If it was so central to a teaching, you expect him to teach it a lot. He only explains the four, the four Noble Truths five times in these ancient texts. Five times. And each time, it's a different. Three of them are very, very similar. The differences are minor. But it's surprising how little the Buddha teaches it. It gets given pride of place because it's said to be the Buddha's first sermon. But it really, what's re recorded as his first sermon couldn't have been because he teaches all these ideas, complex Buddhist ideas, Buddhist words, that would have been unfamiliar to people who were just brand new to Buddhism. As well as his first sermon, it probably didn't make sense. And it's also a genre of writing, a text, that belongs to a period of about 100 years after the Buddha died. So scholars generally believe that that so-called first sermon it doesn't really belong to the Buddha. It's possible that what the Buddha did emphasize over and over and over again was this deep insight into impermanent, into impermanence. Deep insight into uh, seeing things come and go. And this is liberating because when things arise and pass in experience, then we have a much clearer sense of how we want to tie it together, how we want to hold on to it, how we resist in it, resist it. We see that the, in the appearing and disappearing of things, there's space around them. There's some kind of, there's times when they're not there. They're unique phenomena. They are not anything to hold on to. They are, they kind of support the movement of the mind in meditation to not sew things together, to keep letting go, to keep allowing just things to be there and be there and be there. And it cultivates a very deep equanimity, a very deep non-reactivity to experience. And this non-reactivity 
just that not, that seeing coming and going phenomena leads to the mind letting go in the deepest possible ways. So one of the interpretations or one of the understandings of what's called the Four Noble Truths um, is not the cause of suffering, not the conditions that lead to suffering, but rather it's a deep insight into the nature of suffering, that whatever it is that we call suffering, or experience of suffering, that the nature of it is to be a process of inconstancy, of change, of coming and going. And somehow seeing into the nature of that is deeply liberating, that doesn't require us to find the cause of it or the conditions of it. But there is a very deep letting go of clinging, letting go of craving that does go on there. But it's not because we've understood that craving is the cause. What we've understood is the, is the uh, changing, inconstant, uh, impermanent nature of suffering. We realize that suffering is not an inherent part of the human experience and that uh, what we can do is to let go. And this was the Buddha's uh, big insight. So, um, so what I'm offering here now the third day is a variety of different understandings for the Four Noble Truths. All of the understandings are great. What we're doing is kind of expanding the range of how we can use this framework of the Four Noble Truths to understand our lives in different ways. And in different circumstances, different ways are useful. And we're kind of maturing and growing and understanding our life better in all the ways it's possible to interpret the Four Noble Truths. They're the, f f the central framework to organize our human experience on the path to freedom. So, um, thank you very much. And um, tomorrow I'm going to give a little bit the most classic uh, explanation of the Four Noble Truths as found in the first sermon of the Buddha. And uh, it's also fascinating to see how this, this works out. Um, so thank you all very much. And um, I look forward to our time tomorrow. <laughs>